something. And again, there's so many great things happening in the life of our church, and I'm so grateful uh, to be on this journey with you. I'm so glad that you're here. Again, if it's your first time or if you're a returning guest, man, it's great to get to know you. I want to get to know you by name. I want to I want to know your family. I want to just tell you what a privilege it is to be your pastor and, to, again, be on this journey with you. So we're glad that you're here. If you're watching home at home, God bless you. We're glad that you tuned in or anywhere around the world. We're glad that you're tuned in. So let's get into the Word of God. Are you ready? All right, if you're ready, say jump. All right, here we go. All right, let me ask you a question to get into it. Think about... Here's what I want you to do. Try to think about the most difficult, the most demanding, the most challenging experience in your life right now. Okay? Shouldn't be too difficult. I mean, after all, it is 2020, right? So you've probably got a number of things to choose from. And honestly, if you are going through something difficult and trying and it's testing, it's hard, and and it's bringing suffering to your life, there's probably not too many moments of the day, to be honest, that you're not thinking about that already. So do you have that thing in mind? Just go ahead and name it. Think about it. What's that thing? What's that issue? What's that relationship that you would describe as the most difficult thing I'm facing right now? Think about that issue, that thing you're dealing with where there seems to be no answers on the horizon, no solutions in sight. Think, think about, I mean, if you had to label any, anything in your life as impossible, as hopeless, as beyond repair, this thing might be it right here, okay? So you got that thing in mind? Got it in your mind? Now, now take just a moment and very honestly give an answer in your heart, in your mind to this next question. What has been very important. Listen carefully. What has been or what is your current response to that thing? What has been your response, your reaction to that thing? It could be a health crisis, could be a crushing financial pressure, it could be a health issue, it could be a relationship that's full of tension and conflict, it could be something with one of your children's behavior, uh, and, and, or maybe it's the sorrow. Maybe it's the sorrow that weighs on you every day of watching a loved one destroy their life because of the choices that they're making, their priorities. It, it could be some huge global issue, you know? Uh, can I just share the one that's been weighing on my heart lately? It has wrecked me this week. I, I, and, and continually is this issue of human trafficking. I cannot get it off my mind. I, I'm praying with tears. I, it just, that is something that's consuming me. It's an issue that seems impossible. It seems so dark and evil. You can't even begin to put it into words. That's the thing. So it may be something like that for you, not necessarily a personal issue, but a, a global issue, human trafficking, terrorism, drugs, uh, the epidemic of pornography in our world, poverty, those cycles that just enslave people and lead to these other things. Or, or it could be just something as you know, ordinary and average is, is just these daily frustrations and daily challenges that, you know, we all experience. But maybe for you, it seems like they're just coming down on you like rain right now. And it's just eroding and wearing your joy thin. Now, here's the truth, okay? Here's the truth with every single one of us, with every single one of those trying times that some of you may be experiencing. Probably all of you can think of something. Here's the truth. That difficult thing, is not what defines us. It's the way we respond to them that reveals our true character. Okay? It's not the thing that defines us. No matter what it is that you name in that blank, it's how we respond that reveals our true character. Well, let me say it like this. How you respond in, to things like that, it reveals who or what you're most dependent on. And you think about that, think about your, your most recent hardship, your greatest crisis, that thing that's maybe brewing this morning, and your reaction to that, your, your reaction to that is reveals, it reveals for me, for you, for all of us, who or what we're most dependent on. So, so I think about it like this in my own personal life. I, I think about it, I ask this question, what is your default response, Mark, when you encounter unexpected things in the church and, and disappointments and hardships and suffering in your own life. What's your default response? You could ask yourself that as well. When the pressures of life press you, when the storms rage, when you seem to be plagued by problems and setbacks and disappointments, when the hurt is deep, when the tragedy leaves you in turmoil, we all have, listen, we all have a default response to those things. All of us. It could be anger. It could be rage. It could be depression, could be uh, slipping off to complaining and murmuring, despair, blaming. It could be a dozen and one different things, but it's your normal, your go-to response in the face of that that reveals 
your true character, and it reveals who or what you're most dependent upon. Now, here's a powerful thought. Soak this in this morning with me. What if, just imagine with me, what if in our personal lives and in our collective life together as a church, what if in each of those difficult experiences that we're each dealing with at some level, what if in each of those difficult areas and seasons of life, what if our default response was prayer? And and not just prayer, not just prayer, but what if it was earnest prayer? Our default response, earnest prayer. What, What if in every circumstance that we face, ranging from the disappointing to the absolutely devastating, our response as the people of God was earnest, fervent, passionate, persistent, the powerful seeking after God with all of our heart in prayer? What if? You wouldn't recognize this community. You wouldn't recognize your life. You wouldn't recognize, you'd be like, who is that? You wouldn't recognize this world if that was the case, if God's people, the church, adopted that default response. Now, I know I shared last week with you a little bit about what I dream about. If you were here, I, I just kind of shared my heart. And we're not really in a series right now. If you're new to, our, uh, if you're new to this family, we, we typically preach in series. Um, you'll find that to be true most often. But here, just for these few weeks, we're actually... Um, Getting ready, and you know what? I just realized what I forgot. Connie, Connie. I just realized what I, I didn't forget Connie. I forgot what Connie asked me to do. And let's just kick that up because this is, I'm just at a perfect spot to do that. But we're gearing up. I'm not in a series right now. I'm just sharing some things rolling off my heart and, and I'm dreaming about, and I'll get back to that in just a minute, I promise. But uh, we're leading up to August 30th. So I have a few weeks here that these things don't necessarily fit into a series, but we're leading up to August 30th, which is a significant Sunday. In the, it's it's I could say it's one of the most significant Sundays in the life of our church. It's called Faith Promise for World Missions. It's our World Mission Focus Sunday. It's where we take this entire Sunday and we bring in this really dynamic speaker, Kelly Love. You're going to love her. You will. I mean, you'll, you'll love Kelly Love. You will. She's amazing. She's passionate. She's, uh, it, it, her message is so compelling. And she's going to help us fix our eyes on the, what our great and mighty God is doing around this world. So do we got that video? Is it too late? Did I just, did I just wreck the train this morning? Yeah, can we? Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm seeing some hand signals there, but maybe. There we go. Awesome. Okay, that's just talking about. When you give sacrificially oh. to the World Evangelism Fund. The Holy Spirit empowers amazing mission and global ministries. What you give provides full-time missionaries with a salary, medical insurance, and housing while they serve. Your giving for the World Evangelism Fund starts new churches around the world and provides training resources for equipping pastors and church leaders. It provides literature in more than 90 languages. This includes resources for pastors and Bible-based teaching materials for children, youth, and adults. What you give supports the work of the whole global church of the Nazarene including the worldwide ministries created by colleagues in our Global Ministry Center. The World Evangelism Fund also makes it possible for Jesus Film Harvest Partners, Nazarene Compassionate Ministries, and World Mission Broadcast to flourish. Could you have ever imagined that the sacrificial offering you give to the World Evangelism Fund could accomplish so much? It's because Nazarenes globally are pooling their resources to send the gospel to people in 159 world areas. Without the World Evangelism Fund, none of these mission efforts would be possible. The World Evangelism Fund enables the Church of the Nazarene to fulfill all these ministries. All right. Okay, so I kind of jumbled it there, but but that's a significant weekend coming up, April 30th. Go ahead and mark that on your calendar and write it down. And uh, hey, let me just say, if you're looking for a, a church with a very polished, intelligent, articulate pastor, this probably isn't the church for you, okay? <laughs> It's probably just the real deal here. I mean, just get what you get, and, uh, but I, I love you with all my heart, and I will serve you <laughs> with everything within me if you'll let me, all right? If you'll let, if you'll, if, I'll lead you if you'll let me, all right? I'll do my very best with God helping me. But I, 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 when I dream about our church, that's one thing I dream about. I, I dream about a church becoming a church of earnest prayer. I dream about the people of God rising up and saying, that's going to be our default response. We're going to decide with God's help to be people of earnest prayer. And so I just kind of had this moment in my life this week where I saw that happening, okay? For example, I could see couples in our church. I could see those of you watching online, maybe 
in the midst of your financial pressures, getting your budget out and, and calling out to God and saying, God, we need you to intervene. And we not only need you to help us in this immediate crisis, but we need you to give us the wisdom so we can stay out of this crisis. We can get that free. We can stay out of this crisis in the future. I can see couples doing that this week with their finances, not as their last resort, but as their first response. I can see couples getting together in the midst of their conflict or, or maybe separately, but either way, going to their knees quickly when they have a conflict in their marriage, in their relationship, because they don't want the strain on that relationship to become a weapon in the enemy's hands to destroy them. I, I could see parents after an exhausting and exasperating day with their children. I know none of you really know what that's like, but just take, it happens sometimes, okay? To, at least to us, I don't know. <laughs> Our children are awesome, but... We still feel that way, and maybe you do too, but I can see parents in this church after one of those days where you just say, man, I don't know what I'm doing. I can see you slipping into your child or maybe even your teen's bedroom when they're asleep and just silently kneeling beside them and silently but powerfully calling on the name of Almighty God for your child because you know that the gift of earnest prayer is the best gift you can give your child. I could, see, I could see men in our church, listen, I could see men in our church when faced with the strong temptation to give into their flesh and to click on that pornographic website again, I, I could see them instead of doing that, instead of getting sucked into the destructive trap the enemy lays for us constantly, this is an epidemic in our churches. And we just get real here at JC Naz, okay? We just kind of call it out like it is. But I could see men, instead of doing that, instead of giving in, instead of heaping on more wrath from God on them and more guilt on their life, instead they call out to God in earnest prayer who is always faithful and who always promises a way of escape when we're in those moments. Amen? I could see that happening. I could see someone this week getting a phone call and, and getting some very unexpected and hurtful news. But instead of lashing out in anger, instead of, you know, just trying to act out in the flesh, instead they reach out to God in earnest prayer because their first response, their, listen, their first response is to put these things in his hands and to trust him and to wait on him because he is faithful. I can see a church. I can see a church like us gathered together at strategic times in the face of overwhelming odds, engaging in earnest prayer because we really believe that that kind of prayer is what brings strongholds down and it's what transforms entire communities. I can see that happening. So what I want to do this morning is I want to fuel that fire within you as well. And I want to show you a picture this morning of a, of a church who prayed earnestly. I want to show you the result. I want to show you what God did in the midst of that. And, and I want to show you how God's blessing and favor are poured out on a people who will determine that that kind of prayer will be their default position. And as we continue to worship together this morning, I want, you to, I want to ask you to ask God. I want to challenge you to ask God to stir that fire within you, to stir that and deepen that passion for this kind of prayer in your heart to where Truly, in your life, in your home, in your heart, in your marriage, in your parenting, at your job, whatever you're involved in, whatever ministry you're engaged in, that earnest prayer would be your default response. Because please, please hear me this morning, church. Please hear this. Our only hope, our only hope for seeing the vision that God has given us come to reality, the only hope for seeing the victory that we sang about this morning break through in this dark, messed up, evil world, our only hope is, is not, the, not our finances, it's not our programs, it's not our building, it's not our talent, it's not the number of people that come and sit in these seats and fill these seats every single week. Our only hope is to be a people that are filled through and through with the power of the Holy Spirit who get to their knees quickly and consistently in earnest and sincere prayer. That's it. It's our only hope. If you believe that, come on, lift up your voice and let someone near you know that right now. Amen? That's our only hope. It's our only hope. So turn with me to Acts chapter 12, would you? I love this story so much because it's, it's a powerful picture. It's a powerful story of what happens when, when ordinary people engage in earnest prayer. Okay, these people that are going to read about, this church, it was not a super church. It was not a, not a, not a it was just your ever- everyday, average, ordinary group of people who love God and committed their lives to following Jesus. And that's who we are. And so this is a great picture of an earnestly praying church. Here we go. Let's get right into the Word. Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It was about that time that King Herod arrested some. He arrested some who belonged to the church. 
intending to persecute them. So imagine that. This, this ruler, this governing authority, starts arresting people at J.C. Naz with the intention, with the aim of persecuting them, physically persecuting. Now, let me give you a little history here, okay? I think this is important to know the Word of God in this way as well. King Herod that's talked about here. This is Herod Agrippa. Herod Agrippa. This is the grandson of Herod the Great. You may know Herod the Great. We talk about him a lot. He, we run across his story at Christmas time. Uh, usually. He's the king who was alive at the time that Jesus was born. He was the king who met the Magi who came from the east because they saw a star, and they said they were following that star. They had this meeting with King Herod the Great, and they said, well, where's the one born king of the Jews? And Herod's freaked out, and he's disturbed, and all of Jerusalem with him. So he says, go find the baby. And let me know where he's at so I can worship him too. This is the same Herod. This is the same Herod that got duped by the Magi because they were warned in a dream by God to not go back to Herod but return to their country another way. And he was so enraged that he had all the babies in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under killed. He's a psychopath. He's a madman. This Herod that we're reading about in Acts chapter 12 is his grandson. So the family heritage of psychotic delusions and rage and persecution just continues, okay? Continues down the family line here. So, so Herod, he had, verse 2, he had James, the brother of John, the same James that we read about uh, who wrote James in your book, if you've never read that, short little read. Great, practical, powerful little epistle we have in our Bible. This is the James. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter as well. So he's your typical politician, right? Wherever the applause is the loudest, wherever his base is, is most impassioned, that's where he's going to go. That's what he's going to do. So he saw that this persecution of James, the killing of James, uh, was met with uh, great approval and, and really roused up his, his people. And so he said, man, all right, let's, good. let's keep this thing going. So he arrests and sees Peter as well. This is so interesting to me. You find this constantly through the book of Acts, if you look carefully. You find this even in our world today. And, and it's just this, whenever the church is persecuted, whenever people try to silence the church and destroy it, the crazy thing is, you see this all the time, it just makes the church stronger. It just builds it up more. It just begins to multiply. And, and that's why, on one hand, I want to encourage you, I don't understand today why Christians today are wringing their hands in anxiety and running around all scared to death and anxious and uncertain when the church goes through tough times, and let me tell you, folks, we're in a tough time right now as a church. I don't mean just J.C. Naz. Actually, God has blessed us unbelievably in this season. We've got challenges like every church, but I mean the church universal, the church worldwide, the church particularly in this country is going through some tough, tough things. Have you seen what they're doing to the people of God in certain states? It is unbelievable. It's like, do we, do we even live in America anymore? We're going through some tough times, but, but still, we shouldn't be fearful, and we shouldn't be timid, and we shouldn't stop gathering together, and we shouldn't give in to fear. You know why? I want to say to people like that, don't you know your history? Don't you know your history? Don't you know that they've been sawing us in two? They've been stoning us. They've been chopping off our heads for a long time. They've been doing that to the people for a long time, but I'm telling you, with every flogging, with every imprisonment, with every beating, with every persecution, with every drop of martyr's blood, the church, the church with its message of living hope and salvation through Jesus Christ is alone has just spread like wildfire. It's just spread like crazy. And I, I want to tell you this morning, J.C. Nash Church, whether you're here or you're listening online, that's who you are. That's who you are. This is in your spiritual DNA. You ought to take heart. That ought to impassion you and embolden you this morning. And that's why I really believe, I really believe that everything we're experiencing, all the challenges and the obstacles and the seemingly, to us anyway, setbacks are really a set up by God to prepare us for our greatest days ahead. I really believe that with all my heart. I, I don't always see it as clearly as I do on some days. <laughs> but I'm holding on to that hope and I believe it. And looking back helps me to look forward in faith and confidence. And so I believe that. But hear me. The greatest days of victory that God has prepared for us. The season of unbelievable harvest. The years of increase. Hear me. They will not be experienced apart from the earnest prayer of God's people. We won't see them. 
if we're not a church of earnest prayer. The against all odds, overcoming power that we see at work in the early church, the great victory that we see them experiencing despite unbelievable obstacles and intense persecution. Listen, the primary factor that made that possible for them and for us is this decision right here to be a church of earnest prayer. It says the church was earnestly praying. And again, I want you to know really quickly here, this wasn't something they did sporadically. This wasn't something they did just once in a while on special occasions. This earnest default position of earnest prayer was not something they did just when things got really, really, really bad and they ran out of all other options. It wasn't like that for them. Let me give you some examples to kind of drive that point home. Acts 1.14, it says they all all, they all joined together constantly in prayer. They were waiting on the Holy Spirit in that instance. They joined together constantly in prayer. When they had to replace Judas, remember him? Judas sold Jesus out, rebelled against him for 30 pieces of silver. He later was remorseful. He went and hung himself. So that left the original 12 apostles with only 11. They felt a great need to fill that position. And they had two qualified candidates, and they didn't know who to pick. And so this is what they did. They prayed. They said, Lord, you know everyone's heart. This is in Acts 124. Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which one of these you have chosen. In Acts chapter 2, we read that they devoted themselves to a number of different things. But most of all, best of all, they devoted themselves, it says, to prayer. To prayer. Acts chapter 4, Peter and John were arrested by the temple guards in that day. They were arrested. They were roughed up. They said, don't you ever preach in the name of Jesus again. And they were like, pfft. Whatever, you know, we're, might as well ask us to stop breathing. We can't do that. So what they did after they were arrested and threatened and beat, they went back to the church. They reported everything that had happened and noticed the default response. Remember, your default response reveals your character and it reveals who or what you're most dependent upon. Look at their default response. Acts 4.24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Unbelievable. They raise their voices together in prayer. What a great statement, by the way, to be spoken over your life. To be spoken over your life, your marriage, your parenting, your home, your ministry. That that when you heard this, when you experienced this, whatever it is, dark, hard, difficult thing, demanding, challenging thing, you raised your voice to God in prayer. Come on, isn't that the way you want to live, church? You want that to be the pattern of your lifestyle? And you see this so clearly. Every time the church did that, every time they had prayed, they experienced the power of the Holy Spirit enabling them to do things they never could have possibly done on their own. So remember this, remember this, write this down. Whenever we forfeit prayer to God, we forfeit the power of God as well. So so think about that difficult thing that we're facing, or maybe you faced in the past, and, and maybe, and I'm not saying this to condemn you, but maybe you've turned to other things. Maybe your default response was not prayer. You just got to realize going forward in the future that when we choose something besides earnest prayer, we forfeit the power of God for that as well. And we're just left with our own resources and our own strength. And, and for me, I don't know about you, maybe you're better than I am, but that doesn't go very far for Mark Hatcher. I can get about a day down the road with that, and then I'm wiped out. I need a power beyond my own, amen? Our church needs a power beyond its own, and it comes from earnest prayer. So it gives us a little timeline here. It says all this was happening, this intense persecution, this dark, dark time for the church. It happened during the festival of unleavened bread. This is the Passover. This is the biggest, most significant celebration of the Jewish people. It happened during the festival of unleavened bread. And I'm telling you, this was like King Herod Agrippa saying, in your face, church. I'm the man. Don't you ever forget that. I'm in charge, okay? This is pretty dismal. This is pretty intimidating. Now, look at this. You want to know what kind of power comes to a church from God who is committed to earnest prayer? And you want to know how much the prince of darkness, the enemy of our souls, the devil himself, you, know, wanna, you want to know how much he fears true, spirit-filled followers of God who commit to unceasing Earnest prayer is their default response. Here's the picture right here. Look at this, verse 4. After arresting him, after Herod arrested Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So do this math with me. It's easy math. Four, Four squads of four soldiers. That's 16 
highly skilled, trained Roman soldiers for one man. For one man, a fisherman, (laughs) an ordinary, unschooled, average guy. You talk about maximum security. I mean, this is the definition right now. And you know what came to my mind when I, when I pictured this, when I read this? Listen, here's the deal. Here's what this means for you and I. When you and I are filled through and through with the power of the Holy Spirit, when you and I are people of earnest prayer, listen, that makes you dangerous. Amen? Come on, turn to somebody near you and say, you're dangerous, man. You are dangerous. Now, <laughs> I know you may not see yourself like that, You may not feel like that. I I get it. But understand this. When the enemy of our souls, Satan himself, when he has to devote that many resources to make sure that you don't get loose and you don't get mission on mission for God, guess what that makes you? That makes you dangerous. That makes you really dangerous. So here's what the Bible says in the book of James, the same guy that got killed here in in the book here in the Bible, in Acts 12. He says, when you submit yourself to God in prayer, wow, that's a really powerful picture of prayer right there. Submitting ourselves. That's where it starts, humbling ourselves. We don't walk in all cocky like we got this, we're gonna make God do it. No, no, no. It's we submit ourselves to God in prayer, the James says, and he says, then the devil will flee from you. He will flee from you. It's not if, it's it's a promise. He will flee from you. Listen. Satan is no match for you. You understand that, right? He's no match for you because of the power of the one living inside of you. All right? And I look out across this sanctuary today, this morning, and I'm, pro- I'm, I'm just thinking in my mind, some of you, Satan has a whole battalion of demons guarding you right now because you're so dangerous. You're so threatening to his operation, to his agenda in this world because you're so sold out and you're so surrendered to Christ. Because your default response is to put the kingdom of God first and to choose earnest prayer over above any other response. That's why you're dangerous. And he's guarding you. He's on you, man. Like, I don't know what. He's on you. (laughs) He's got you wrapped up. He, He thinks he's got you wrapped up. He thinks he's got you pinned down because of how quick you are to run to the Father in prayer instead of choosing to do it in your own strength and your own effort. So verse five, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying. Say that with me. But the church was earnestly praying. Come on, say it louder. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. That's the bullseye for us this morning. That's it right there. That's where we're after. That's the phrase that stopped me in our tracks, my tracks. But the church was earnestly praying. In the midst of this difficult, overwhelming, dark, hopeless. It had to feel awful. Can you imagine being part of that early church? How would you feel? How hopeless would you feel? Some, some, some people are like, man, I'm out of here. There's no future for this church. Our leader just got, can you imagine the two leaders, two main leaders in this church, you name them, you, you pick them. Can you imagine them getting killed by the sword and arrested? You'd be like, what, what is going on here, man? We, we, we can't, can we even meet Sunday? I mean, can we even do this? Can we do ministry? Can we do it? It would be a tragic, tragic time. But the church was earnestly praying, it says. Now think of all the things that could have been filled in the blank there. Think of all the things they could have done. Just go ahead and imagine that with me, okay? They're in the middle of this crisis. Peter, their leader, gets arrested. The threat is real. The pressure is intense. So they did this. But the church got together and had a business meeting and took a vote. Uh, But the church got together and, and took an offering. Took an offering. We'll get some money. You know, we've got some stuff in savings. We got an emergency fund. Let's pull that together. Maybe we can bail Peter out. Maybe we can bribe Agrippa. I don't know. Maybe we can get, get it done that way. But the church got together and circulated a petition throughout their community. Hey, Herod, look at here. We got 5,000 signatures, pal. Let our leader go. Okay, we're taking this. We'll take you to court. We'll sue you. No. No, I didn't do any of that. But Instead, it reads this way. The church earnestly prayed to God for him. See, they they prayed earnestly for Peter. They prayed out to God for the future of their church because they knew that only God himself could turn the situation around. It was beyond them. And I love the word. I love the word how it describes how they prayed. It it could have just said they prayed, and that would have been good. But it doesn't say that. It says they earnestly prayed. Let me tell you, that word is not there by accident. That word is there on purpose. Earnestly, it means with some sincere intensity. 
It means with some passion. So how would you like to pray like that? And that's, that's the level I want to get to. I want to pray like that. I don't know if I'm there yet. I, I want to get there. I want to grow. How do you learn to pray like that? See, I, I, I don't think this is something you can read a book about and learn how to do it. I don't think this is something you can take a six-week internet course on and, and, and get some certificate and say, okay, I'm an earnest prayer now. I don't think this is something even a pastor can teach you to do. I, I, I don't know how to do that. But I wonder, how do we get to that level? I wonder when someone, after hearing you pray, would they say, man, that man, that woman, they pray earnestly. When I was praying with him, they, they prayed with sincere passion, intensity. Would they say that about our church if they gathered with us for a prayer meeting? Man, I don't, I don't know anything about that church, but I know they pray earnestly. You see, I, I think this is where, how, how we get there. I don't think it can be taught. I think it comes simply from this. I think it comes from choosing to abide in him daily. I mean, I wish I had a fancier answer. I wish I had something a little more complicated. That's it. You just learn through the Holy Spirit's guidance and your submission to him every day, you learn how to abide in Christ. You, you choose every day, in other words, to make the strengthening of your relationship with Christ the primary focus. And so if other things in your life are eating away and eroding that and they're hindering you, strengthening your relationship with Christ, you say no to that so you can make the primary focus of your life strengthening your relationship with Christ. You make pleasing him and obeying him and bringing yourself under the authority of God's word. Even when it costs you, you make that the primary focus of your life above everything else. And, and here's the deal. When you and I make that the rhythm of our everyday life, Here's, here's the result. Here's the natural byproduct. You want to run to him quickly. You don't need a sermon to tell you to do that. You don't need to be manipulated or guilted into it. You want to run to God first because you want to tap into God's power for that need as quickly as you possibly can. And earnest prayer is the conduit that, that makes that a reality in your life. So, I, again, I, I don't know how to teach you to pray like that. I, I don't even know if I know how to fully pray like that. But I know this, I know this. If anything is going to be different in your life and mine a year from now, you know how fast a year goes? It goes pretty fast. And if we're sitting here a year from now in 2021 and we look back, if anything's going to be different in your life and mine in this next year, if we're ever going to find the answer to that unsolvable problem, if you're ever going to experience that breakthrough miracle for that need that is so desperate, if you're ever going to start seeing God use you, I mean really use you to bring people to Christ and bring them to experience salvation around you, it will only happen because you've allowed and you've asked and you've sought after the Holy Spirit to teach you how to be an earnest prayer, to teach you what it means to live that not just as a program but as a lifestyle has a lifestyle. So this group of believers in Acts chapter 12, they did that. They discovered the power that earnest prayer brings. And let me quickly just show you two things, really quick, quickly, two things that I see here that earnest prayer enabled them to experience. Here's the first one, okay, you ready? Write it down, courage, courage. Listen, when you begin to truly understand who the Lord Almighty is, when you begin to understand your relationship to him through Christ, and who you are as a child of the king, when you start to experience in your own life the power of earnest prayer, listen, the byproduct of that, the, the outflow of that is courage. And you begin to have courage to pray things you wouldn't normally pray in situations that you would ordinarily be intimidated to pray those things in. It's amazing to me that the early church had the courage to pray what they prayed in the midst of what they were going through. I mean, again, Peter... He's their main leader. He's guarded by four squads of four soldiers. He's put there by a madman dictator who hates Christians. He's just executed one of the apostles a short time ago. I mean, this, if there is ever an impossible situation, this was it. It seemed like no way out. Again, how much future would you give for this church if you were a part of it? In your heart of hearts. I mean, they, how much hope would you have? For a church like this. And yet, instead of being filled with hopelessness, instead of being filled with fear and consumed by fear, instead of shrinking back and running, listen, they rise up 
They rise up and they call out to God in earnest prayer and they say, God, we know, we know we can do nothing about this, but we know you can. And we're praying to Peter because we know he's your child. He's your servant. You've got a plan, God. And we're asking you to come to his rescue. Let me ask you this. How many things have you stopped praying for? Let's just say the last six months. How many things have you stopped praying for? Or how many things have you never even begun to pray for because that thing in front of you looks so dark, it looks so intimidating, it looks so hopeless? How many things have you maybe not even started praying for because somehow, somewhere along the way, you believe the lies of the enemy? Who said, oh, prayer? can pray. You've prayed before, haven't you? You've even earnestly prayed before. I saw you praying one time with tears. Nothing happened. Nothing changed. So why, the enemy says, he whispers in our ear, why do you think God would do anything this time? Oh, that pastor, he is just hyped up on coffee, man. He's like this all the time. He's just out of bounds, so excited all the time. That's just a Sunday deal. He'll get over it, right? How many things have you even not started praying for because you believe the lies of the enemy in that way? But I want to remind you, church, this morning, I want to remind you that greater that is he that is within you than he that is in the world. And I know it seems, amen, amen, I know it seems like the prince of this world is winning. I know it seems like that. I know it feels like that. But greater is he that is in you. That is the truth. I want to remind you this morning, church, you have a long history of overcoming And you've been given a spirit, not of timidity. You've not been given a spirit of fear, but you've been given a spirit of power, amen? And that power is released when we earnestly pray. I don't don't know. Maybe maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm all messed up. Maybe somewhere along the way my wiring got fried somehow. But I really believe this. I really believe that the more impossible the situation, the greater the problems, the more hopeless it feels. Listen, that ought to cause us to engage more in earnest, sincere, passionate prayer, not less, not less. And I'm telling you, when we see the enemy of our souls prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for whom he may devour, looking to devour families in this church right now, looking to destroy marriages right now, listen, he hates you. He wants to destroy your life and your home and your faith and your joy. He wants to kill it, steal it, and destroy it. That's his only agenda. And when we see the enemy of our souls doing that, when we see him rising up and trying to silence the church and shut the church out from areas where Christ said we should enter and to take territory that Christ wants us to take for him, it's happening. But when we see that, man, it ought to cause us to it ought to do something in us right now. It ought to cause us to rise up with righteous anger and say, you know what, Satan? Not here. No way. Not now. Not in our family. Not in our marriage. Not in our community. Not in this church. You, you may pull that off, Satan, with some other churches, but you're not doing it here. Because we're going to fight. Amen? We're going to fight. And I don't listen. I don't mean with earthly weapons. I don't mean with guns and bombs and fists. And I, I mean we're going to fight with the greatest weapon ever known, the most powerful results ever known. We're going we're to use the power that God's given us to bring down strongholds, amen, to tear down strongholds, and it's the power of earnest prayer. So are there any courageous prayer warriors out there this morning? Anybody? Amen. Here's the second thing. Look what else, look what else fervent, earnest prayer produced. Courage, but also this, peace peace in their hearts. You say, where do you see this, Pastor Mark? Well, verse 6 right here. Peter was sleeping. Peter was sleeping when all this was going. Between two soldiers bound with two chains, sentries stood guard at the entrance. Peter, Peter's sleeping the night before he was to be executed because they were going to have a trial, but there was no way in the world he was getting off. It was going to be execution immediately. And I'm telling you, when you have a fresh encounter with God and you start to experience the effectiveness of earnest prayer, you can find yourself in the middle of your darkest prison. You can find yourself in the middle of your most difficult circumstances and your most painful trials. But you, you as a follower of Jesus will be kept in perfect peace. That's a promise right there from God's word. And did you notice, by the way, we, we didn't read it, but if you look on down, I believe it's in verse 7, you notice that um, Peter was in such a deep, peaceful sleep 
that the angel had to strike him on the side to wake him up. This wasn't a little tap. This wasn't a little nudge in the morning, right? I mean, this was like, bam, you know? And, and how would you like to get woke up like that, right? But man, he's at such peace. He's at, got such confidence. He's like, God, this is in your hands. I may get my head chopped off tomorrow, but hey, I'll be with you. You'll take care of the church. I'm not, I'm not in charge. You're the Lord of the church, not me. He's in such perfect peace. How, how do we experience that? Well, guess what? Paul shows us how. We've covered this passage before. Over in Philippians 4, Paul knew what it was like to experience God's perfect, protective peace in the midst of all he went through. Philippians 4, the Lord is near. I love how he starts there. Did you know that this morning? Have you forgotten, church? He's near to you. He's near to you right now. He's not left you. I don't care how you feel about that thing you're going through. I don't care how difficult, how much pain. He has not left you. He is near to you. He loves you. His eyes are on you. He sees what you're going through. He knows how to get you through that. The Lord is near. So do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in the midst of that thing. Not when you escape it, but in the midst of that thing. He will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The night before, Herod was to bring him to trial, verse 6. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains. Sentries stood guard at the entrance. And suddenly, suddenly, verse 7, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the sail. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up. Chains fell off of Peter's wrist. Listen, here's, here's what earnest prayer does. Latch onto this this morning, okay? We're almost done. Latch onto this. Here's what earnest prayer does. And here's why it's the most powerful force on the earth. Earnest prayer involves God. Earnest, when you go to your knees and you get on your face in earnest prayer, it involves God in the equation. And I'll tell you, church, too many times, when we're going through difficult times, like the one you thought of at the beginning of this message, when you're going through those times, the reason we're so often knocked down and the reason we're too often defeated in those situations is simply because we don't involve God in the situation. We, we don't involve Him in that we, we look at our dilemma, we look at the problem, we look at the mountain, we look at the battle, we look at the giant in front of us, and, and we just, for whatever reason, we don't factor God into the equation. We don't include him. And as I said before, we forfeit his prayer when we do that. But listen, when the church earnestly prays, God shows up. God shows up. The church was earnestly praying for Peter. He was praying to God, and God showed up. Suddenly, suddenly an angel, the Lord, shows up. Light blazes in that dark pit. Chains start falling off his wrist. Prison doors start flying open all by themselves. And Peter walks right out past those 16 soldiers untouched. Hey, listen, church, this morning. God may not deliver you the way you expected. He may not deliver you exactly as you prayed, but I'm telling you when God gets involved, hear me, when God gets involved, it will always, always be better than you could ever imagine. Earnest prayer involves God. Now, just one more thing. I promise you one more thing as we bring this to a close. This is so amazing because I think a lot of us experience this and a lot of us are troubled by this. So I hope this helps you this week. In Acts chapter 12, it says that Herod sees Peter. Okay, we know that. He sees Peter. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we're in the midst of this Passover celebration, the most important, significant celebration of the Jewish people. Passover. You can read about what that's about in your own time. Somewhere, I don't know how long it's been going on, but it's been going on. It's during the Passover celebration. You know this. It was a seven-day long celebration too. Seven days long. And it says in verse 4 that Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So let's just assume it's early on in the Passover celebration. Let's say it's day one, day two, whatever you want to do. And he held him in prison, intending to bring him to trial after the Passover celebration. So Peter was kept in prison. Now, ready for this? Listen, verse 6. The night before Herod was to bring him out. How long was he there? We don't know for sure. But the night before Herod was to bring him out to cut off his head, that's when God showed up. That's when God answered the prayer of the earnestly praying church. Now, mm, does that cause a dif difficulty in anybody else's mind? 
Do you wonder what I wonder? I, I look at this and I'm thinking, hmm, God, I love you and I trust you and you're God, but if you were, if you were going to deliver Peter anyway from Harold's evil grip, why did you allow him to go to prison in the first place? If you were going to deliver him all along, then God, why did you wait all week long? Why did you wait the night before in order to rescue him? Why did you put the church through that, God? Have you ever realized, have you ever experienced that God's kind of a night before kind of God? He kind of seems to work that way a lot in my life as well. I kind of wish he'd work at the beginning of the week. But he kind of seems to wait till the night before a lot. And it wasn't just Peter waiting seven days in prison or however long he waited. The church was gathered up praying for a significant amount of time. I, I want you to know and realize this was no quick half-hour prayer meeting to where they got out of there and went and ate pizza and watched their favorite TV series afterwards. It wasn't like that. They had to persist. You talk about persistent prayer. They had to persist for, I assume, a number of days. And God, why did you wait the night before Peter was to be killed to intervene? Well, here, here's, I think, part of the answer. You do remember, right? You've not forgotten, right? You do remember that this thing we call Christianity, it's not about me. And it's not about you. It's just not about us in any way, shape, or form. It's all about Him. And listen, in God's perfect sovereignty, in His perfect love and goodness and wisdom, if He sees fit to wait until the night before or the hour before or the minute before to show you His hand of power, if he wants to wait until that situation you're in is so deteriorated and so desperate it looks beyond all hope to repair, if he wants to wait until all human hope is gone and you only have him to depend on before he steps in, if that's what he wants to do, guess what, church? Praise his name. Praise his name. Because he's God. He is God. He can do it however he wants and whenever he wants and wherever he wants. And it's not about me. It's all about him. And you understand this, right? God never makes a mistake. He's never lost a battle ever. We sang it this morning. Our God knows only how to triumph. And so you can trust him, amen? You can trust him even in that dark thing, even if it's the last hour. Make no mistake about it. The hero of this story is not Peter. The hero of this story is not the earnestly praying church. The hero of this story isn't even this angel that just busted into this place and blew it up. Like Jason Bourne, baby. Just boom. It's not, we watched some Jason Bourne this weekend, so sorry for that. Sorry, sorry. That's, those aren't the hero of the story. Make no mistake about it. The hero of the story is God Almighty alone. It's him alone. It's always been him. And it's through earnest prayer. It's, it's by getting to that place of prayer quickly. It's by you and I getting to that place of prayer often and staying in that place of prayer as long as we need to. It's through prayer that we see God is faithful to take all the pain and all the struggles and all the battles that we may be experiencing and reveal his glory in a way we've never seen before. And use it, use it, church, amen, to draw other people in salvation to him through us through us. Let's rise to our feet this morning, church. Let's rise to our feet. Let's pray. I, I, don't, I don't know how to say this in an eloquent way. I've kind of I've proven that the entire message, right? I don't really know how to be eloquent. But uh, as, I, as I look out on our world, I know it's so easy to get anxious and angry and fearful and have our default response be something other than earnest prayer. I know that, man. I've been, I've been up and down this last five, six months. And man, I see things that just, they just break my heart. They just wreck me. I, I just see things that, I, I read reports about a five-year-old boy getting shot point blank in the head by his next door neighbor. How, what, kind, what kind of evil exists in a human heart to make someone do that? I, 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 I read about innocent babies and children being sold in human traffic and sexually exploited. I don't want to be graphic this morning, but I, I read about, about young boys being sold into slavery and they're begging for cocaine before they experience that horrendous evil because they're so scared to death. I mean, I, we're just reading about this stuff and it's just, it's overwhelming to me. I'm watching cities burn. I'm watching churches close. I'm watching the people of God in, in some ways shrink back in fear. And God, make no mistake about it, I think God is using all this to purge the church. 
But I'm just seeing all this stuff, and I, I, I don't know what else to do than other to go to God in earnest prayer. I just don't know what else to do. We're coming upon elections that's going to forever shape the landscape of our nation, I believe, in a way that we've never seen before. And again, I'm not trying to stir up fear within you or anxiety or anger or anything like that. I'm just saying we've got to, more than ever, church, we've got to be the church of earnest prayer. And I don't know what I hope would happen as a result of this, but I hope this is more than just a sermon that we just walk out of here and say, oh, another sermon, another Sunday, and, and uh, I, I don't know what. I just pray that something significant, I pray a, a switch gets flipped in your heart. I, I would pray that maybe there's some discussions that happen as a family or as a couple or between you and God even. And I just pray that something is transformed in us as a church as a result of this. Amen? And I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to do it because I don't even know what it looks like. But I believe he'll do it if we let him, amen? And if we ask him to. Let's pray. Father God, we love you. We love you with all of our heart. And we trust you, God, with every fiber of our being. The depths of our heart, God, we reaffirm our faith in you and our commitment to you, God. Help us to live as your kingdom people. Help us not to respond to things the way the world responds, the way our friends respond even. We want to be people that by the way we respond, we show what our character is is made of, and, and, and that we're filled with the fruit of the Spirit, and that we are dependent on you and you alone. Now, we love you. I pray for you to strengthen this church and bless this church and send us out of here like wildfire just to spread your truth and spread your hope, God, to everyone we possibly meet. Father, I love you. I praise you. God, we trust you to do all the more than we ask or imagine in the midst of this dark, awful, violent world of ours. We love you, Lord. We'll keep fighting to the very end. God, with every breath that's within us, we'll rise up in the face of this. We'll say we're not giving up and we're not quitting and we're not shrinking in hopelessness. God, we'll rise up in prayer as your church in Jesus' mighty name. Would you keep your head bowed, please, for one more prayer for one more minute, okay? Just one more minute. This probably is the most important minute of the entire service. In 1 Timothy 2, in 1 Timothy 2, I believe it's in 2, yeah. It says, it says that God our Savior, it talks about God our Savior. 1 Timothy 2, verse, verse 4. It talks about God our Savior. And he says, here's what he wants. Here's what God our Savior wants this morning. He wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And you just think that, let that sink in this morning. Here's what he wants. He wants all people to be saved. The reason he wants you to be saved this morning, if you're not already, is because we have a sin problem. The Bible says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, which means that's a big time problem. It is not going to be good. It's going to be tragic. It's going to be unbelievably terrible for those who have never turned away from their sins and turned to Christ if we come to the end of our lives without him. And I just, I, I, I love you too much. God loves you more than that to allow you to continue unchallenged, to continue to build your life against a wall that is false and that is not going to hold you up at the end of your life. Can you imagine investing all your life and working so hard and getting to the end and realizing it was all for nothing? So we love you too much this morning not to tell you the truth, that God loves you enough. He wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. The truth is you need a Savior. We all need a Savior. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Our sin separates us from God. But thanks be to God, Christ came and died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sin, to take our place and to die our death so that we could be forgiven, we could be cleansed, and we could have our relationship with God restored again. And not only make it to heaven someday, but live the overcoming abundant life today. Listen, if you need that, here's what we're going to ask you to do. We want to pray a prayer with you. We're just going to ask you, if you never have been saved, if you need to know your Savior in a personal way and cry out to Him and ask Him to forgive you and help you live a new life, you know maybe this morning you're not in the place with God you need to be. You're not, you're not in right relation with Him. Your eternity is uncertain. You don't know where you're going to spend eternity if you were honest about it. We're going to ask you to raise your hand. No one looking around. 
You say, why do I have to raise my hand, Pastor Mark? Here's why. Because we want to help you make a genuine commitment to Christ, not an emotional response. We want to help you begin a journey. So all we're doing by raising your hand, we're not calling you up front. Amen, I see a hand right there. We're going to bring you a bag. One of our pastors is going to bring you a bag. One of our leaders, they're going to put that in your hands. And after we pray this prayer, I want you to look through it. When you get home, listen to that stuff. Look through it. It'll help you make some really good steps to continue this journey with Jesus. Anyone else? We got one hand over, one courageous man right here. Another young man right here. Another man right here in front of me. Yes, we're going to bring you a blue, but wait till, wait till they come to you. And then we're all going to pray together, okay? Not do anything to humiliate you or put you on the spot. We won't want to lead you in this prayer of faith. There's another hand in the back, maybe a couple. Praise God. Praise God. God's working. God's working. Anybody else? We'll wait. Anybody else? Say, I need to be saved. I need forgiveness of my sins. I admit the truth that I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I can't do it myself. All right. If, if someone's by you with a blue bag, you can put your hand down. We found you. Let's all pray this together, okay? Let's help our soon-to-be new brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. This is awesome. Miracles happening right now. As God saves these souls, we're reaching out to him. Let's all pray it together. Let's pray this prayer of faith. Because the Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, right? Let's all do that together. Father God, Father God, I come to you in faith. I repent of my sins. I turn away from my old life. And I turn to you today. I receive in faith the new life that Christ purchased for me. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose again from the dead. And he is the Lord of all. Lord, save me and give me the strength to follow you and obey you all of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Again, I so appreciate you, you being so supportive of this time because we're bringing new life. This is, what we, this is why we exist, to help all people to be saved, to point them to Christ, to get them connected to him. Amen. That's happened this morning. We can praise God for that. If you made that commitment, we'd love to chat with you and get to know you a little more. But welcome to the family of God. Amen. If you see someone with a blue bag, slap them on the shoulder. Welcome them with a smile. All right. God bless you guys. You're an awesome church. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.